All right, welcome. We are beginning our second semester of Bible Institute. Uh, thank you for those of you that are investing your time into these studies. I assure you, I am um, very happy and honored to invest my time into the studies. And uh, our, our prayer as a church, my prayer as a pastor, is that you are gleaning and learning. A um, uh, few things, a uh, few statements I'll make. I very much believe that there is no new thing under the sun. So anything that I say or a vast majority of what I say is stuff that I've learned and gleaned or read over uh, the last um, almost four decades of being a Christian. And so um, I don't want you to think that I think I'm reinventing the wheel or anything like that. That's not the case. I may say a few things in the uh, classes that might be new to you. Some of them are original, and uh, I, I usually point those out, um, not because I want any credit. I want you to know that they're my thoughts, and um, I don't teach my thoughts as emphatic or, um, or mandatory beliefs. I simply put out there that it's something I've learned or gleaned, and uh, perhaps you want to put more study into it. So... Um, Having said that, we're going to jump right into what we have. Let's start with prayer. Heavenly Father, bless our time of study. Thank you for all those that take the time and sacrifice to watch and learn and grow. Pray that you'd uh, allow us to have your spirit of illumination and your blessing upon our study. Give us understanding. Help us to learn. Help us to be good students and disciples of the word. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to start this semester out with something uh, that I find to be very, very important to me. Um, and it is uh, these 14 keys to um, understand how to study your Bible. I wrote them down as 14 keys needed to study your Bible. What we're essentially talking about is the... Um, is the these are interpretive laws. We call them in theology hermeneutics. Um, there's no particular name. Actually, the, the, uh, the word hermeneuin uh, in Greek means to utter. Um, now, what I find interesting about that is that back uh, during the, the time of Hermes and Plato, these, these philosophers understood that it is essential for a people, a society, a culture, to preserve their lives, to preserve their way of life, uh, to preserve their, excuse me, Adam, when it, we're at, we hit like 30 minutes, let me know. So I'm going to cut these a little shorter. Um, so how do you preserve? Well, you have to write, written record. No one's surprised by that. But what happens when the written record outlives the people that wrote them. And Hermes came up with this idea that somebody who reads a, an historical record where the people that wrote the record are no, lo no longer there to perhaps explain it, he, he referred to those writings as orphaned writings. And so when I talk to people and they say, you know, I tried to read the Bible, I can't understand it, you know, and, and sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes it's because they just let their Bible open up and they jump into a passage that, you know, you don't really have a good understanding of to begin with. Um, so what I always do, it, particularly when I'm talking to an unsaved person, I try to illustrate this. I say, you know, and just to be clear with the point I just made concerning Hermes' remarks, um, the Bible is not an orphaned book. It is not an orphaned writing. Uh, Jesus promised that when he was gone, the Comforter would come. He promised that the Holy Spirit would guide us and lead us into all truth. So I always use this illustration. You don't have to use it. It's just something I'm comfortable using. And I often illustrate that point with this. If somebody handed me Einstein's paper on the theory of relativity and said, okay, Joe, this is everything you need to know about the theory of relativity, 
I can absolutely guarantee you I would be lost. But if Albert Einstein were alive, or I were alive in his day, and he handed me his paper on the theory of relativity and said, Joe, I want you to know this. It's important to me that you learn this. And I'm going to sit by you, and no matter how long it takes, I'm going to explain everything on this paper to you so that when we are done, you will know a whole lot more about the theory than when we started. And here's what you need to know, that when you get born again, and if you remember, that was what we started on first class last semester, when you get born again and the Holy Spirit comes inside of you, He's literally living in you, He is now the divine illuminator. That means He will guide us in all truth. And so whenever you reference the Bible in, in relation to any other book in the world, literally, this is not an orphan book. The whole, if you're saved, you have the Holy Spirit. And, and that means you don't have to be an ultra intellect. You don't have to be a person that has a college uh, degree. You don't have to have a master's degree. You don't have to have a PhD in theology. This book was written to the common man so that the common man could understand it. And I um, enjoy pointing that out because in 2 Peter chapter 1, it says in verse 19, we have also a more sure word of prophecy whereunto ye do well that ye take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. What does that mean? If you, and by the way, on the, um, on the video, you'll have a, a place where you see the notes typed out. I strongly admonish you to print those out and you'll have, by the end of our three-year institute, you'll have, in my opinion, a very valuable um, accumulation and assortment of wonderful biblical truth and doctrine and biblical history um, that you would pay tens of thousands of dollars to get just a small portion of if you went to a Bible college. And it's all here for you free. Thank the Lord. So, uh, no man has the right to privately interpret scripture. No one has the right to do that. That's why when I say, if I ever mention something that I feel is original to me, I tell you, this is what I think, this is what I believe. Now it's up to you to go study it out. No church has it, meaning no denomination has it. Um, obviously, you, you know, when I was a Roman Catholic, I, I was taught that the Roman Catholic Church was the only true church. And all the other churches were, um, were um, subordinate to those. You know, um, and so I was taught that the Roman Catholic Church, in particular the Pope, uh, as the Vicar of Christ, was the only person who could divinely interpret truth. And so that's not, that's certainly not true. No church has it. And no college has it. I added that one in for me because um, I know a lot of people who, uh, I, when I hear, where their or who their alma mater is, I have a pretty good idea of where they're going to stand and land on most issues. And uh, sometimes that's good, and sometimes it's not so good, because you will bring into your theology the prejudice of the school and the professors when you go in and study. That's why I tell you that this is not of any private interpretation. You need to get in your Bible and you need to study it. Why? Because in verse 21, for the prophecy came not in old uh, time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. What does that mean? That means that every uh, time God moved a man to speak or to write, or to preserve, that man was actually bearing the load or bearing the burden of either um, biblical revelation or um, 
being given the words by inspiration to write them. A lot of people like to call those the originals. But what about all of those that are directly responsible for preserving the Word of God over the last 2,000 years? The Bible talks about these men, and it's not just talking about like Peter writing this epistle, or John writing his gospel, or Luke writing the book of Acts. This is that, in my opinion, this verse does not only apply to those, to those men, either in the Old Testament or the New Testament, by whose quill the Holy Spirit chose to write. I believe this verse applies to the whole kit and caboodle. From, you know, the oral in Adam's day in the garden, all the way up to the end of the millennial kingdom. And so I, that, that's what I believe. Now again, you don't have to believe that. Uh, so the Bible contains four notices that are to be reverenced and understood when it comes to Bible interpretation. In Genesis 41, in verse 16, And Joseph said unto them, Do not interpretations belong to God. You know, Joseph was an Old Testament uh, person, figure, um, also a type of Christ. And when we get into uh, these laws of biblical interpretation, there is a law of typology, a law of types. Not only was Joseph a real, literal, historical person who lived at the time um, in which he uh, walked on the earth, uh, but Joseph was also known as an interpreter of dreams. And Joseph said concerning this interpretation, do not interpretations belong to God. When you really get that into your heart, you're going to be uh, less likely to continue to run to commentaries and find out what any man says about it. You know, God loves you and God will allow you to understand the word if you have a desire to learn it. Daniel 2.28, another man known for his ability to interpret dreams. Daniel said, but there is a God in heaven that revealeth secrets and maketh known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. He said, hey, there is a God in heaven. Daniel understood that he was not interpreting the dreams and it came from God. Luke 24, 45, referring to the Lord on talking to those on the road to Emmaus, then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. It was the Lord that opened their understanding. John 16, 13, Howbeit when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. Jesus said, Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. And in 1 Corinthians 2.13, Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Listen, this is a, an historical book. It's a geological book, it's a mathematical book, it's an anthropological book, it's a book that deals with physics, it's a book that deals with astronomy, it's a book that deals with zoology, it's a, I think you're getting the point. <laughs> but most of all, it's a spiritual book. When a person says, I can't understand a thing the Bible says or a thing you say when you preach, then that person needs to come to the conclusion they just, they may not possess the Holy Spirit, may not be saved. Because one thing I know is the Holy Spirit does his job. <laughs> That's for sure. 1 Corinthians 2.13, which things also we speak, not in the words which, man, which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. You get a chance to look up John 6, 63, and here's what you'll find. Jesus, according to some, put himself in the middle of a beehive 
of concern because he had just given the discourse uh, that his, his body is bread and you must eat. You know, the bread and the Roman Catholics say, yeah, that's the, that's the justification for transubstantiation in the Eucharist. No, no, no. What they cease to read or, or um, um, you, you know, uh, coincidentally seem to leave out, conveniently leave out, is the idea that he said, hey, everything I've just revealed and said unto you is spirit. It's spiritual. I'm not saying you need to be a cannibal to eat of my flesh, because that's what the Catholic Church teaches and some of the Protestant churches. Transubstantiation, consubstantiation, and so forth. What he's saying, that everything I just taught you, you need to take it into the fourth dimension because it's spiritual. Now, when you get to that place, you're going to understand that this is a spiritual book. And even though it's a spiritual book, there are laws by which this book needs to be interpreted. And if this is not the first time you're learning this, that's great. Perhaps it's a review. If it is the first time, I would pay pretty close attention. Because when somebody asks me, how do I learn and study my Bible? Uh, this is one of the things that needs to come into play because there are laws of interpretation. And let's hit them. Number one, the law of literal interpretation. What does that mean? The law of literal interpretation means that you always take the plain literal interpretation of every verse. That is the first initial reflex approach to every word and verse in the scripture. You say, but pastor, I read my Bible and it is obvious that some of those passages are not literal, they're figurative. Well, that's fine. And so here's what it means. You always take the plain literal interpretation of every verse except where it is absolutely, <coughs> pardon me, impossible to do so. Or unless the passage is obviously figurative then you understand that this is a grammatical, um, poetic, or literary license by which the Lord goes and is teaching a truth or principle. It is not proper to read the scripture and figuratize things that are clearly meant to be literal. And so in John 6, he gives this figurative speech I am the bread of life, he that eateth of me, he that drinketh and all that. But then he says, hey, that was all a, 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 a form of speech, a form of, of literary interpretation because everything I just said is spiritual. All right, question, how do you know when it's figurative? Well, the answer is this, the Bible always gives and defines its non-figures and types. So, for instance, that discourse in John 6, well, that's pretty scary. Is Jesus submitting that we need to be cannibals? No, because in the text, he clearly says this is spiritual. That is how we are to take it. Matthew 7, 6, the Lord Jesus references dogs. Well, I know what a dog is. It's a canine. And you can go and do the whole zoological, um, you know, uh, 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 genealogical record of, of a canine, but he's not talking about literal four-legged, tail-wagging, bone-eating creatures. In the text, he's clearly talking about men, males, who are false prophets. You go to the book of Revelation and you get to chapter 21 or 22 and it's talking about the new heaven, new earth, new Jerusalem and then it says for outside are dogs. Well, do you mean to tell me that God has something against dogs? Like, you know, new heaven, new earth, but dogs are not allowed? That, that's not what it's saying. What it's saying is that everyone who says, I have truth, and is a false prophet, those people 
are outside of God's righteousness and plan for the ages. And they are being burned in the lake of fire. Likewise, in 2 Peter 2, verses 1 and 22, referring to swine, he's talking about false prophets that are female. And there's a number of them, especially today. They have books all over the place. They're all over the television. You should be very careful. Do not follow a dog. Do not follow a pig. They're false teachers. And then, of course, the... I think the most relevant, not, not relevant, but the most obvious, Jesus gives a whole discourse in John 10 on sheep. Now let me ask you something. Do you think he's talking about those woolly animals? No, obviously he's talking about people, those who know him. Law number two, the law of first mention. Here. Here. The first time a word appears in Scripture, it sets the tone, associations, and basic meaning of the word throughout the rest of the Scripture. Of course, the word's definition may be clarified, even uh, extended, further, uh, contrasted, qualified, but the original meaning will be the same throughout the entire Bible. So for instance, I said this the other day in, in, uh, in church, that the first time the word love is used, one would think that the word love would be mentioned in the relation between a man and woman, and it is not. Pardon me, the first time the word love is used is in relation to a father loving a son and a son loving a father. So that sets the tone of the context for what love is throughout the Bible. Because if you remove that word out of its primary context, the law of first mention, you're going to have a whole lot of bad doctrine and people actually contradicting Revealed truth from the Bible all in the name of love because they've redefined it. I also wrote something down and I'll address it here but get into it more in just a little bit. The word elect. I talk to a lot of people that call themselves Calvinists and they keep talking about election, 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 election. Now I thank God that when I got saved... I got into a good, independent, fundamental, doctrinally sound, Bible-believing Baptist church. And so I uh, never was, um, especially early in my Christianity, was not duped by this. But I will tell you, about two, three, four years into being saved, I met a lot of very persuasive people that were Calvinists. And, uh, you know, I will tell you, when they explain... Because you got to realize something. Like all other false prophets, they use circular reasoning. It's all circular reasoning. But I'm telling you, as a Bible student, according to the law of first mention, if you get a concordance, and you can, you can download, upload, uh, uh, olive tree. Is that upload, download? I don't know the term. Uh, but you can get uh, olive tree on your phone, get the app, and you go in and hit the word elect... Always make sure you've got the King James Version. You put elect in there and then you hit go and it'll, it'll give you the following verses. Isaiah 42, um, Isaiah 54, Isaiah 65, two mentions there. Matthew 24, two mentions. Mark 13, two mentions. Luke 18, Romans 8, Colossians 3, 1 Timothy 5, Titus 1, 1 Peter 1 and 2. And 2 John two times. You do all that addition, here's what you're going to find out. That the word elect, according to the law of first mention, in Isaiah 42.1, God is talking about His elect. Referring to Jesus Christ, prophetically, the Messiah coming as a Jew coming to save the nation of Israel, the Jewish people. 
Now what does that do immediately? The word elect, according to first mention, God's talking specifically about a race of people. In particular, the Savior of that race. And all I'm submitting to you is this. When you go and study your Bible and you look, all the, look up all the verses where the word elect is used, in every case it's referring to a Jew. It's never referring to a group of people that God has predestinated to be born again. In other words, when somebody tells me they've been to a certain college, I know that they are approaching some terms with a, an extreme prejudice, which leads to really bad doctrine. And so those people that fall into that category are, in my opinion, quite sophomoric because they think they know a whole lot more than they do. And again, you can say, well, where's your college degree? I don't have one. But I got this. And as long as I can back up what I'm telling you with this, it doesn't matter where you go to school. So law of first mention. Three, law of primary application. I got to move. Every scripture has one primary doctrinal application. Primary application. That's vitally important. Number four, the law of progressive revelation. Every doctrinal truth is made increasingly clearer as more revelation is given. The example, Genesis 3.15. Uh, it's not a complete revelation. When we talk about uh, Lord, the Lord promising the woman's seed to crush the serpent's head. Well, what is the woman's seed? We don't know. But the law of uh, progressive revelation is that if we read the Bible with the idea that God has promised the seed, we can easily see that now, th consequently, through the covenants, remember, that's why I took the time to teach that last semester, God, through the Abrahamic covenant, and then through the Davidic covenant, and uh, then through the Messianic covenant, God is going to add information to that. That's the law of progressive revelation. Number five, the law of subsequently added details. That means this, that there are times God is going to mention a person or an event. But he's not going to give you all the details necessary at that time. He's going to add to it. So Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 accord, record the same events. The only difference is, is that Genesis 2, God is adding much, much more detail to what he already mentioned in Genesis 1. They're not separate events, okay? He's taking the time. That's why there are times you'll get into the book of Kings and Samuel and people will find quote-unquote contradictions. Well, God, God will mention a particular person in a particular time at a partic uh, through a particular event. And then maybe in Chronicles, God will re-mention that, but he will either take away or add detail. And people say, see, that's a contradiction. No, it's not a contradiction. I, you, like I, there are times you'll tell a story, but maybe when you're telling a story, you may choose to add certain details at times or not. Add, it, it's not a contradiction. It's just, you know, adding or, or not uh, choosing to add details at a given time. Number six, the law of complete mention. God never attempts to maintain anyone's personal views on doctrine. What that means, brethren, is this. He gives us only his own complete idea, thought, or context on anything he deems important for our spiritual lives. That means you and I don't have the right to add to or take away from what God says. Number seven, the law of context. I thankfully learned this as a young Christian. Somebody would come up to me and say, hey, what's this mean? And I would say, I don't know, but give me a little bit. Let me get my Bible. Where's that verse at? Oh, you said it's 2 Timothy. The, and then I go and I read the context. Now, that's especially true in the Old Testament you got to make sure you've got the context of what it is saying. So what does that mean? Taking a verse out of its own context will lead everyone to wrongly divide the word. Yet the, the command is to rightly divide the word. 
And that is simply done by taking scripture or verses or words out of context. A text without context is a pretext. Here are some questions in order to gain the context. Number one, who's speaking? That's important. To whom are they speaking? That's a typo, it should say Jew. But is God speaking to a Jew? Is God speaking to the Gentiles? Or is God speaking to the church? You don't get that all in order with these other laws. You get to the book of Romans, man, you're going to be in a heap of trouble. That's the problem with the Calvinists. They use circular reasoning, and when they get to Romans, they've got to fit all of their doctrine into uh, two or three chapters of Romans, and so now they've got to recalibrate the whole book. That's bad doctrine. That's really, really bad hermeneutics. That's horrendous. Let me get to the next side. Thirty minutes? Great. Thank you. Last semester we went over an hour. I'm not doing that this time. Number eight, law of agreement. The law of agreement is this. Never use one verse of scripture to contradict another. When you read and say, you know what, I think I just found a contradiction. Know this, the contradiction is you and me, my understanding, your understanding, it's never the scripture. Surely to the unlearned reader there are many so-called contradictions. Leviticus talks very explicitly about the dietary laws and then when you get to Acts 10 the Lord tells Peter kill and eat. But that's clarified in Colossians 2.14. So God clarifies the apparent contradiction and there are numbers of those. If a person wants to find a contradiction. There are many of them there. Now, to be clear, I'm not saying the Bible has contradictions. What I'm saying is that if you don't understand laws of interpretation, um, you're going to be in a, a hot mess. Number nine, the law of repetition. The great teacher, the Lord Jesus Christ himself, the master teacher. He said everything as perfectly as it could be said. No one could ever improve on his teaching style or method. The Lord Jesus often used the law of repetition in his teaching. And I'll tell you why. There are times he gave the double verily, verily, verily. Whenever there's a verily, verily, you better pay attention. Truly, truly, I say unto you, when he uses the law of double mention or the law here of repetition. So for instance, when we talk about the virgin birth, two gospels contain the event of the virgin birth, but all four gospels contain the feeding of the 5,000 miraculously. What does that tell you? That tells you that there's something about that miracle that the Lord deemed more important for us in the church than perhaps, I'm not saying the virgin birth wasn't important. Don't put words in my mouth. I'm saying that the law of repetition is important and when you're going to uh, get into uh, learning or teaching the scripture, it's really important you understand that. And uh, number 10, the law of triple reference. Every verse in the Bible has three applications. Obviously, number one, it's historical. It really happened. Did they really cross the Red Sea on dry ground? It really happened. You don't have to figuratize that. It's literal. It happened. Well, did, that, did that bush, was it really on fire or was it a figment of Moses' imagination? No. The Bible says it was a burning bush and it was exactly that. So it, the, the, these are historical events. Now, to simply read a historical event we need to secondly understand that it somehow, some way fits, fits in to a doctrinal calibration. What do we believe about that? Number three, the spiritual side of this. What do you do about it? There has to be a practical side to the scripture. That's why people who approach the Bible solely with an intellectual approach very often miss the practical application of it. 
Number 11, the law of types. I mentioned this briefly. But the law of types means that in the Old Testament in particular, there are people, places, and things, and events that are literal, historical things. They really happened. And the law of types is a correlation between these people, places, and things with New, uh, with New Testament anti-types. Again, let me give you an example, an illustration. The burning bush is the type. What is the anti-type? The anti-type is Israel going through the tribulation. Literally, when the world is on fire and they're going to make it through into the millennial kingdom. That's true of the ark. Uh, that's true of people like Joseph, Moses, David. True of people like Cain, Abel, uh, and the uh, oh, oh. Ba uh, Balaam. Jude mentions those three. So, number 12, the law of double interpretation. Many prophecies in Scripture have primary and secondary application. I gave you an example on your notes. The good tidings of Isaiah 52, 7 is that God is reigning in Zion. In Psalm 2 and in Zechariah 14, the good tidings are that Christ is sitting on his throne in the millennial kingdom. You see that? It's very simple, perhaps a little subtle, but yet it's relevant and true. The law of double interpretation. The good tidings, behold, uh, you know, I give unto you, or we give unto you, I forget how it goes in Luke, uh, you know, good tidings of great joy. That means that not only is God sitting on the throne in heaven, but he who is now bringing you the kingdom, your king has now come. Number 13, the law of gaps. The Bible often skips periods of time without commenting on them. You'll read a passage of scripture and you come, maybe a verse or a chapter starts and it came to pass. That means that there's been a gap of time. Okay? That happens often. Now, the Bible will always reference a gap when it's there. Don't put gaps in that don't belong. Okay? That is why, well, there's a number of reasons why, but me as a um, self-professed student of scripture, um, you know, I, I, have, I, I know a lot of people that believe in the gap theory. The gap theory is that between Genesis, chapter, uh, Genesis 1, verse 1, and Genesis 1, 2, there's a gap of billions or even hundreds of millions of years so that they can account for the evolutionary process. The Bible never says that. Do not be guilty of putting a gap where the Bible never says a gap is. God will always let you know where the gaps are. And then number 14, and finally, we'll end with this, the law of emphasis. Never overemphasize nor underemphasize a doctrine or truth or term unless the scripture does. So here's what happens. Never overemphasize salvation over sanctification because then you have a very carnal Christianity. There must be a balance. Never overemphasize sanctification over salvation because then you'll have a bunch of self-righteous people. I will also add to that, and I will finish with this, I've known a lot of people, and I've already alluded to it, and I think it's kind of obvious, that the Calvinist, whenever you talk to them, the only terms that matter to them are election, which I can blow a hole right in the side of that. Predestination. You can blow a hole right in the side of that because the word predestinate or predestinated is used only four times in the New Testament. And in each time, it's referring to what God is doing in the life of a believer after they come to Christ. And it's always in the context of conformity to Christ. In other words, this is a term 
that references sanctification, not salvation, to take that term and use it in the context of salvation is um, obviously against the laws of hermeneutics. And then on the opposite side, you've got the, um, the Pentecostals. Whenever you talk to a Pentecostal, what's the first thing they want to talk about? Feeling and gifts. Guilty, overemphasizing bad doctrine because of poor hermeneutics. Guilty, overemphasizing 1 Corinthians 12 through 14 and guilty of really bad doctrine because they're not taking those passages in light of hermeneutical biblical interpretation. They overemphasize, dramatically, drastically overemphasize. Very, very bad doctrine. And then, of course, whenever you overemphasize something, you will, by definition, underemphasize something. And that's true of anything in the scripture. That's why the Bible talks about rightly dividing. Everything has to calibrate together. If there's a problem with calibration, there's a problem with interpretation. And so these laws, I pray and uh, believe, will help you when you approach the scripture uh, properly. Okay? Lord, bless uh, this class to the heart of all those that took the time to watch it and hear it. We pray in Jesus' name.